So we are in the section where we have meditation verses on the nature of the self. So what verse are we on? Starting with 224. 224. Can you help us out, please? Do we have Ganesh this evening? Yeah, I'm here, Jim. Hari Om, Ganesh. Hari Om. It's easier for me to hear. I love Ganesh's chanting, but when it's right close to my ears. I'm old and I my hearing is not what it used to be. Or my memory. Or my eyesight. Or my knees. Brahma Bhutastu Sansrityai Vidvan Navarta Te Punaha Vignyatavyamata Samyag Brahma Bhinnatva Matmanaha no more does one return to the world of transmigration after having become of the nature of Brahman. One must therefore strive to realize one's identity with Brahman. So, this self-realization is not a temporary thing. No more does one return to the world of transmigration. Meaning, what happens once you get that it's you were you ever not you that's why when people have come to me frequently because they had a drug trip and they say oh i had an experience of the self 20 years ago and i've been trying to get back there Sure, it was a marvelous experience, but that wasn't it. What is the state of ignorance? I have this deeply rooted conviction in my mind that I'm the body, the body plus the personality. Wendy and I were going through Manduki, I think it was with you, where we had the term Jiva Bhavana. Yeah. Yeah. That's where I lift that term from. 
Bhavana means an attitude or a feeling. Jiva means the idea that I'm an individual. So it's a deeply rooted conviction. It's like hypnotism. So it's not that the jiva changes into something else. It's not something the jiva undergoes, oh, I lost it. What it means is when I really see, oh, I'm not a person. That was just some very vivid collection of beliefs and feelings. I have always been nothing. And it's myself. And then I become very clear on the fact I'm always me. Who got out of bed this morning? <laughs> Who knew? Who had activities during the day? Who knew it? I do. You're here in class. Who knows it? I do. That's yourself. Now, I tell this very true story. So I was about six weeks in the ashram in the Hague. And, you know, I considered myself pretty woo-woo. You know, I'd learn to channel and read auras, and see chakras and stuff like that. So I was meditating and all of a sudden there was all this gold white light. I was just bathed in ecstasy. <laughs> oh, I must have realized the self. So I get on the bus and I go out to the other house that we had out in the app to see Ram. He was the guy who ran two houses. Ram, I think I realized this. I was all really tell me. He said, I'm sitting on my bed, meditating, and there was this gold white light everywhere, and I was just bathed in ecstasy. It was all really. He said, well, what was going on before that? I was just sitting in meditation. He said, I mean, who knew that state? Well, I didn't said, and when you saw the gold white light and felt the ecstasy, who knew that? I thought, oh, I did. I started to get the idea what he was driving at by that point. <laughs> and then he said, and who's aware of this conversation right now? Oh, I am. He said, that's yourself. Drop the experience. So we must give up the idea that we're going to have a super sensuous experience of some kind. Now, nobody has loved to get high more than I have. I love wackadoodle mind states. And the nice thing about the spiritual life, if you want those, there's plenty of them. But that's not it. It's this profound shift in my understanding of my identity. Like I've been hypnotized all of a sudden. Everything is clear. And I see that personal sense of self. I never was that. It was like a dream. And if you really get it, if you have samadhi, that means it needs to last no more than seven seconds. And you get it's myself, and then you can't ever lose it when you ever stop being you. It's knowledge, it's not an experience, but it's a paroksha knowledge, it's a direct experience. Now, don't try to figure this out. <coughs> this doesn't make sense, put it on the shelf.
but there's once I've seen that there's a student who's begun to get a real sense of their self nature. They may forget at times, but they basically get it. Then they go off on a meditation retreat. So much of the world falls away. Come back. Question I ask. Do you know more self now? No, dear. Now you may have had much of the world fall away. Which is a deeper vision of it all. But did it pass? Yes, dear. You still get annoyed at so and so at work? Yes, Jim. Mind states. No, it does get better. The mind states do change. The way to heal the mind is to get out of the mind. But when you've had that understanding of who you are, you don't lose it. When you see you're not a mind state, no matter what mind state the mind is in, it can be in a very uncomfortable one. No, it's not you. Any thoughts on this? Next verse. Satyam jnanam anantam brahma vishuddham param swat siddham Nityanandaikasam pratyag ninnam nirantaram jayati. Brahman is existence, knowledge, absolute. Extremely pure, transcendental, self-existing, eternal, indivisible bliss. Not essentially different from the individual jiva and with no differences within or without. It is ever victorious. So let us parse this one. So Brahman is, say that it started at the beginning again. Existence, knowledge, absolute. Existence, knowledge, absolute. I am. I shine as the light of awareness. I don't go up. I don't go down. I don't have less existence or more existence. In the mind, tune up the mind, introvert the attentive faculty. Go on, who are you? Who hears the traffic? You see that you're just the light of pure awareness. Again, I like the term chidakasha, the space of awareness. It's the one yoga position. Next idea. Extremely pure. Yes, be shuddha. The body can be impure. The mind can be impure. The thoughts can be impure. I am the sweet and never tainted. So you screw up in the world. The ego identified person says, Oh, I'm a bad person. I'm so full of shame. I'm in a, what did the psychologist call it? Shame spiral. How could I have done that? I've always been the most terrible person in the world. I need mine, I need mine. I'm a worm. But the yogi says, oops. Major fuck up. 
Mine's reacting. I am. Just go do something. Stand there. Let the equipment shake, rattle, and roll. And don't get involved. You be the center of the cycle. Now, when your mind is settled down, if you need to make an amend or an apology, you do it because it's good manners. But it doesn't improve yourself. Get out, get out. You are already pure. You can't be improved. You can't be tainted. Don't believe me. Look. Next ID. Transcendental. Whatever goes on, I am there. Whatever happened through the past, good things, traumatic things, I was there to know. Time has moved on. I have always been there, shining as existence now. Right here, right now, I am. I know. Still, existence now. I transcend every experience. Really good things happen in the world outside. None of it touches me. And then when it changes, not yet, when, as it will. Negative things happen. None of it touches. Next idea. Self-existing. Yes. Swayam Boo. There is nothing needed to validate my existence or to validate my identity. So many people think they are some sort of a narrative, some sort of a story. You go to a party and someone says, tell me about yourself. And what they expect you to say is, I grew up in Los Angeles. I'm a musician by trade. I'm 76 years of age. No, no that's right. Can't remember how old I am. I live in Oakland, yada, 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 yada. I'm describing the body and the body's experiences, stories. And I have a very dear friend who's totally screwed up his life through drug addiction. And he's ashamed of who he is. He's putting his life back together. But he doesn't have a narrative that he's proud of anymore. So he feels worthless as a person. You need nothing to 
validate you. Ready are perfection itself. You already are the source of all love and happiness. No circumstance is needed to define you. So often times when we're in public, we have some sort of ego agenda. We just want to impress people, get some attention, or be noticed, get some approval. Oh, that's human nature. Yes, it is. It's painful. One of my favorite stories. This uh, person was talking with a Westerner who had traveled a lot with the Dalai Lama. And they said, what's he like? What's he like? His response was, he's always the smallest person in the room. A knee short stature. He has nothing to prove. No one to impress. Next idea. Eternal. Nitya. Eternality is outside of time and space. We have two words. Well, actually, several, but two ideas. We've got ancient Puranam or Sanatanam. If you're really, really, really old, ancient, the so self does that do in time. But nithyam eternal means now. Do you realize you have no way of proving the past existed? The past, in fact, for you right now is nothing but a bunch of ideas, memories, images. For you right now, the past occurs in the now as a memory. Isn't that weird? You are always Just the same way. So nitya eternality is outside of the time space continuum. It's always now, and then everything shifts for a new now, and then it shifts for a new. What we conceive of is the past and the future, just ideas. Next idea. Indivisible bliss. Indivisible bliss. So we talked about this when we studied the arm and the body. What I want is a blissful mind. I'm experiencing indivisible bliss all the time, even when I feel crappy. So what I think bliss is, is not what bliss is.
So I like to start by defining Anand as no sorrow reaches there. Then we have, again, the imagery of Lord Hanuman embracing God. I want to feel this happy, this full, which is the mind retiring into itself. Mind drowned in the self. As Matuki says, soak the mind in the roar of the whole. Because the self is bliss absolute, the mind is bliss. It becomes blissful in two ways. There is a mediated experience of the bliss of the self through an object, a medium, which is always partial and temporary. And then there is a non mediated experience of the bliss of the self, which is achieved. Through fire, through sannyasa, through tyaga, abandon. Next idea. So, uh, no, not essentially different from the individual jiva. Yeah. So again. I like to use the example, if I'm looking out into the room, I have the full range of my vision. If I close one eye and make a tube out of my hands and peep through the tube, my vision appears to be limited, just to a little hole. But nothing has happened to my eyeballs. So also the jiva, the limited sense of self, seems to appear that the mind is filled with inus and minus. How am I doing? Am I okay? What do they think of me? This is mine, that is yours. What do you think of me? All that stuff just gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Nothing's happened to existence and awareness, nothing at all. Just the mind gets more and more restricted. So when I take up mature vairagya, that desire to give up attachment to all experiences gained through the senses and all identification with any form of self. Oh, it's still me. I don't get a new self. Done the cosmic striptease. Remove what appeared to be limiting adjuncts, but they never really did. Always we start with the direct experience. I can't remember with whom I was talking about this. So many teachings talk about. Uh, oh, it was, again, when we were going through Mandukya, the different schools. Wasn't that with you yeah. or was that with yeah. me? No, that yeah. was with me. Yeah. So different ideas of, of God or the self. There's a higher self that I'm going to channel. Or there's a self beyond the self, you know, or uh, 
God is there and I've got to change from this to that, behave this way instead of that way. You know, morality or purity or invoke the gods to fix this individuality. So many religions and spiritual practices. It's all about trying to fix or expand or do something to this jiva. That I'm going to have to have an experience of other self. The self, like it's up in the sky someplace. But Vedanta says, no. Who sees the phone? I do. What's yourself? Yeah. What's yourself like? I'm a worm. I'm a limited person. Now let's examine that direct experience of I. Don't go looking for another self. Let's examine that very direct experience. It's you. Now thin the mind. And withdraw your identity from the know-of-all. Oh. The body, prana, I'm not the feelings, I'm not the thoughts, and I'm not Jiva Bhavana, the thoughts of self. That quiet mind introvert your attention. Notice the knower. Chidana Nobha. And this consciousness. Sangam. I'm completely detached from the equipment. Oh. I thought I was a person, and I never was. How weird. It's the same self you've always been. You don't get a new self. You just see the real nature of the self. I was watching uh, one of the discovery shows. I can't remember which one it was. And they were bringing up treasure from the Atocha. Any of you seen any of that? This is a Spanish galleon wreck with treasure from the 1500s. And the guy brought up this crusty thing that was kind of in the shape of a cross, all covered with barnacles. So they take it, and then it is this thing. They don't get a new thing. They, oh, this is just all crusty and stuff, we want to get something else. They put it in these various baths, which then kill the barnacles, and they remove the barnacles. And it's the solid gold Spanish cross encrusted with precious gems. It was gorgeous. But it was always there. It was just covered with barnacles. Is this making sense? Mm -hmm. So if you want a beautiful gold cross encrusted with gems, you don't take the one that's encrusted and set aside and look for another one. You start with where you're at. I've got this cross. Looks pretty interesting, but it's all covered with barnacles. Let's remove the barnacles and see what's there. Likewise, 
Who sees the foam? Who sees the glass? I do. That's yourself. Yeah, but I'm a worm. I'm so unhappy. And I've done such terrible things. And people have done terrible things to me. Okay. You got a lot of barnacles. <laughs> now let's remove the barnacles. Viveka Vairagya. That's what we do. We reveal, we realize the self that has been not fundamentally different than your experience of the ego. What is the ego? Self plus what it is in frustrations, some stars, fossils. Remove the incrustations. See what's essential you that's been there all the time. Now listen carefully. You're not going to find a good person. Oh, what I am inside is a goody goody. I'm nice. You are the Shudham. Extremely pure. Near Rupaham, no form at all. Chibakash, the space of pure. All right, next verse or next idea. You're more right, nice, different within or without. So here, Shantra is beginning to intimate ideas about this phenomenal world. So we've spent so much of the book discriminating between the self and the not-self. Well, I have some news for you. We lied. There's no not-self. What we've been calling the not-self is also the self. We have two scriptural statements about the world that we have to reconcile. And Shankara defined discrimination. He said, quote, Brahma Satyam Jagan Nitya. Brahman alone is real. Phenomenal the world is nitya, literally a lie, an illusion. Okay. The world's not real, it's fake work. But then Chandogya Upanishad says, Sarvam Kalpidam Brahma, Sarvam Indam. That's a technical term. All this means the phenomenal world. And it has this wonderful word, Kalu, which means verily, really, is Brahma. Well, make up your mind. Is the world an illusion? Or is the world Brahma? Yes. We'll get into that. But fundamentally, everything I'm looking at is Brahma. It's nothing but God. It's not good. It's not bad. It's perfect.
Well, the ideas are even more in this first. Last one. Okay. It is ever victorious. Yes. Meaning this self. This is what Jesus meant when he says, I have overcome the world. Doesn't mean you do some battle. Every other spiritual practice is partial, temporary, temporal. I fall back into sinfulness, into suffering. Atma Vidya, knowledge of the self, is ever victorious. Solves all of the problems. Wonderful verse. Very pithy. Next one. Section 48. All manifestation absolute. Yes! So, before we start it, um, Yoga Vasishta, which is one of my favorite texts, uh, written a little bit before Shankara, posits three questions. We have the seven questions in this book. What is bondage? How does it come about? How does it continue to exist? How do I get out of it completely? What is the not-self? Who is the real self? And what is the process of discrimination between the two? Remember those? Mm -hmm. In Yoga Vasishta, we have three questions. Who am I? What is this world and how has it come about? Now, we've spent most of the book up to this point dealing with the first question, the last shloka, just began to hint at the second and third question. So now Shankar is going to step into dealing with what is this world? How does it come about? Let's see what he says. Salidam param advaitam swasma danyasya. Vastu no bhava, nahanya dasti kinchit samyak, paramarpatatva bodha dashayam. This absolute oneness alone is real, since there is nothing other than the self. Truly, there is no other independent entity in the state of realization of the Supreme Truth. Okay, so he starts with what is the instrument for the realization of the self. Understand we're talking about two things here. Both bondage and liberation occur to the mind. The self is ever free. What is the instrument for knowing the self? This is the real knowledge. This is the perfect knowledge. This is the self evidence of the self. The world is known through the triple factor, what we call the triple T. I, Jim, through seeing, know the table. I, Jim, through hearing, know the track. You go through all the senses. I, through manas, no feelings. I, through buddhi, no the intellect, no thoughts. How do you know you are you? 
You do not see, hear, taste, touch, or smell self. You do not emote yourself. Descartes said, I think, therefore I am. He could see his thinking, which implied there was a knower of the thoughts. But I don't know. Did he ever try not thinking? See if he disappeared. How do you know? You are you. You are not an object of cognition. It is light trying to see your eyes. I can see the table. I can see the phone. I can see the arm of the chair. I cannot see my eyes. Boy, must not be able to see. Well, that's stupid. I see. How do you see with my eyes? What do your eyes look like? I don't know. I haven't seen them. I've seen the reflection of them, but I've never seen my eyes. I see. You are not known as an object ever. But you are not unknown. Now, this knowledge is the only real knowledge. Self evidence of the self. But with the subtle intellect grasps that it has its uh -huh. That's when the buddhi, the intellect, becomes buddha. And that doesn't change the self. The intellect is not the instrument for knowing the self, like you know thoughts. Think the problem two plus two. You can see the thought, two plus two is equal to four. You will not know the self like you knew that thought. You don't think yourself. But the mind can reflect on direct experience. Yeah, there's nobody there. Yeah, I get it. That vast, empty, that space, that shoreless ocean of me. It's not the direct experience of the self. It's the reflection on that direct. Now, where does it go at night when you're sound asleep? Gone. We're not gone. That's gone. Doesn't mean it's not important. So in this verse, Shankar is pointing out what is the Pramad, the instrument for knowing the self. The self is its own means of knowledge. The great cosmic joke is everybody already has it. So when the great 20th century Saint Meher Baba used to say, everybody's already realized, that's what he meant. You are not a mind state. Mind states are stupid. They come and they go. Next verse. Yaridam Sakalam Vishwam Nana Rupam Pratitam Gyandat Tatsarvam Brahmaiva Pratyas Tashesha Bhavana Adosham this entire universe, which because of ignorance appears to be of infinite forms, is in fact Brahman alone, which is free from all limitations of thought. So this is an idea. There are other texts which we study, like Yoga Vasishta, 
Tripura Rahasyam. Of course, the greatest one on this is Mandukya Upanishad with the Gaurapadakarta, where we examine this book. Wendy and I just went through this this week. In the fourth karika, the fourth verse, the second chapter, Gaudapada says, the phenomenal world is quite unreal and the proof of its unreality is you can see it. <laughs> what? <laughs> it makes no sense at all. But it does if you back up and see what he's doing with this. So the way he approaches it, is to compare the waking state to the dream state. Now, first, I want to give you the philosophical definition of reality. Reality with a big old capital R. That which is never subject to negation. What do I mean? So who here has had a dream this past week? What did you dream about? Um, I dreamt that we were on a hike, but uh, we were actually on a surfboard. On the hike. So. On a surfboard on a hike. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> so going down the hill, somehow we were on a surfboard. Hanging ten of the rocks. So was it real? No. But while you were dreaming, did it seem real? Yeah. Yeah. There was a slight sense of how is this happening? Yeah. But when you woke up, you were very clear that it wasn't real. Yes. What made you determine that it wasn't real? Was there it a surfboard in bed with you? No, I was in bed all the entire time. But what happened to the surfboard? It disappeared with my dream. Yes! What about the, 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 the mountain you were climbing down on the high? Where did it go? Also disappeared. Yeah. It was negated. That's what I What she's saying is describing that philosophical notion. So do you understand the philosophical notion? I have the dream. While I'm dreaming, the dream seems real. And then, poof, it's gone. Oh my God, was that weird? I was so vivid. But to the dreamer, the dream objects, the dream people, the dream situations, the dream body I'm in seems real. It seems just as real as what you're experiencing right now. How do you know you're actually in Thursday night class? How do you know this isn't a dream? You know? You won't as long as it's not negated. Okay. So, you are the god of your dream. The way in which your dream comes about is mini maya, I call it. It's a microcosm of the way in which the infinite brings about the world of name and form. So in the dream, Let's walk through what happens. So I assume you got ready for bed? Yes. Do you take a warm bath, maybe drink some nice tea or something like that? Yeah. Sometimes I have a bath. Yeah. And then you get in bed and 
turn off the light, punch your pillow, and uh, you get sleepy, right? Mm -hmm. And then the first thing that happens is you go to sleep. Philosophically, sleep is the non apprehension of the waker. It is the experience of avarana shakti. Avarana shakti means veiling power. When I'm sound asleep, I'm no longer aware of my identity as the waker. Go on. Then the mind itself projects. It projects a dream world of time and space. There you were on a mountain, right? Yes. Yeah, pretty big. How'd you get a big old mountain inside your head? <laughs> yeah. How big was the surfboard? Was it a mini board or a big one? It was a big one. Yeah. You had a Maybe six feet? How'd you get a six foot surfboard? You don't have six feet between ear and ear. You literally create space inside your mind and time. You went from a higher elevation to a lower elevation, didn't you? Yeah. Was he on the same board with you or a different board? Different board. Is he a good mountain surfer? I don't know. I don't think I saw Great dream. <laughs> but you have a world of name and form outside. You have a dream body. And it's what I call a locus of perception. Sometimes we're above things in the dream looking down. Mm -hmm. But most of our dreams, I'm inside a dream body. I look out of my dream eyes. Was that you know, the kind of dream you were having? Yeah. And I have thoughts and feelings inside. Now, you have in your, your waking state reality, do you have any aches or pains going on? Yes. Okay. Did the dream body have them? No. Isn't that nice? I always see perfectly in a dream. It's very interesting. I like that dream body. <laughs> but all of it the world outside the body and the dream ego that's identified with it and the subtle world of thoughts and feelings inside all of it is created by my mind I have reenacted microcosmically the creative process of the infinite. So what Mandukya thunders, all of this is nothing but consciousness. It is the total mind. And the names and forms come about sankalpena by means of imagination. Just like your mountain circle. No different. It's just who's doing the dream. These bodies are all characters in Ishwara's dream. So the world is not created the way a potter makes a pot. The world is imagined by the end. Now, this idea of sankalpa, 
of intention or will in the Vedanta and the Vedas is connected to speech. In the Hebrew scriptures, how does God create the world? Speaks it, right? He says, let there be light. And there was light. He doesn't go to his workshop at the North Pole to make light. This is poetry. It's mystic poetry. All of scripture is not history. It's mystic symbolism. This is the problem in both the East and the West. Was there really a Hindu temple in Ayodhya where Ram was born? Doesn't matter. Ram is yourself. This is mystic symbolism. Yourself is unborn. It's not about a temple, a birthplace. Was Jesus really born in Jerusalem? Doesn't matter. The infancy narratives are about mystic symbolism. Same with all of our stories of gods and goddesses in Hinduism. So, Maya is that process whereby the impossible appears to be possible. How is it that consciousness that is one without a second, that is immovable, sthita, still, Gita will use the word kutasta, like a mountain that doesn't move, still, stabbing, yet has an entire universe. We get words like prapi bimba. A bimba is a mirror. A prapi bimba is the reflection in a mirror. So if I walk into the bathroom and I see my face in the mirror, is there really a person in the mirror? Can I pull the reflection out? No. It is the mirror itself, which appears as the reflection. If I go up to the top of Twin Peaks in San Francisco and face west, pull out a pocket mirror and hold it up, in the mirror is the entire downtown of San Francisco. There's a city in the mirror. How did I get over cable cars and buses and all those buildings inside the mirror? Is there really a city in the mirror? No. Yes. I'm not going to get it out tonight, but if I get out the crystal ball, I think you've all been at a class where I've done it, haven't you? Hold the crystal ball, which is spatika. It is crystal. It's stone. You look on the crystal ball and you see upside down reflections of things. But I can't cut open the stone and pull out what was in there. Does the stone undergo a change? Does the stone turn into the things reflected in it? Does the mirror undergo a change? I don't like my mirror. I want one like these kids do. The mirror in their house, they go look at the mirror and they go look at youngsters in it. My mirror has ugly old people in it. <laughs> I don't like my mirror. I want it to change into hot young 
Is that how it works? <laughs> Does the mirror undergo a change at all? So also, what appears as the world of name and form is nothing but God itself. So the entire universe is suspended in it like a hologram. Like a dream. Now the ramifications of this are profound. One of the things Ram Das used to say, dying is completely safe. Why is dying completely safe? Nobody dies. The being you are is birthless, changeless, and deathless. Not just because you've taken a Vedanta class. Children in Gaza. So, I mean, starving people in Sudan, the being is Brahma. Who here's had a nightmare before? Was the nightmare? Uncomfortable or fe fearful or anxiety producing? Yes? Yes. Was it real? Was it negated when you woke up just as much as somebody is dreaming? I'm not saying. The children starving in guys, Gaza is not like a nightmare. I'm not saying they're not suffering. I'm saying in reality, okay. everyone is okay. Because this entire world of name and form is like a dream, like a hologram. Now, this is not just a philosophical idea that the Rishis came up with. This inside is the direct result of deep experience. If you continue to tune up the mind, if you continue to let go of attachment and gratification, the world will start to thin a very transparent thing. And it seems like you can stick your hand right on through. It becomes very un it you. Yeah. Brahma alone is real. The names and forms are illusory. This world that is perceived by the senses 
Sarvam Kalvidam Brahma. Always. It's barely Brahma. So the practice that's implied here, endeavoring to dial down my reactivity, oh, oh. if I'm disturbed, no matter the cause, I'm the one with the attachment, the expectation, the identification. Let go. Let go. Otherwise, we get fond of meditation. Oh, I can't stand the world. I watch the news. It's so upsetting. I want to just be in meditation at home. Spiritual. That's not freedom. That's not freedom. One last point and I'll let you go. Would you share with us the moment where Francis had his great insight when he kissed the leper. Um, so Francis was a rich boy and had plenty of beautiful things, beautiful clothing, beautiful silks, beautiful life. And in Europe at that point in time, Leprosy was a disease that just basically rotted your skin away and your fingers would fall off, your nose would fall off, your ears would fall off. Thought to be really highly contagious. Um, smelled bad, looked bad, disgusting. Get leprosy, you were taken outside the city walls and thought to be dead from everything you knew. There's a couple versions of the story, but Francis will say in his own words, as he tells the story, that there was a day he came across to the leper. He was going down the street, and he almost turned away because he was so disgusted by the smell and the sight and the fear. But for some reason, he stopped and embraced the leper and kissed the leper. And what Francis says in his own language was at that point in time, everything that was bitter had became sweet, and he was able to just stay in the world just a little bit longer. And then he just left everything he knew and started being a wandering beggar. Yes. That was his moment of realization, I believe. That was his last vasana. Mm -hmm. That was his last aversion. And he had the intuition to lean into it. It's a beautiful story, but it's incredibly instructive what we need to do in order to see the self in and through. Thank you for sharing. All right. I've taken you a little bit over. Now, next week is Holy Week for the Christians. I'm not going anywhere. So can we have a quick vote? You guys, you want to have class next week? I'll be here. I'll be here. Yes. Online, is there anybody who does not want to be online? Okay, we'll do class next week. Let me hear that. All right. Thank you, Jim. Om Pur Namada Pur Namidam Pur Nat Pur Namudachate Pur Nasya Pur Namadaya Pur Nameva Vishishate Om Shanti 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 Hari Om
श्री गुरु गुरुभ्यो नम हरि ओम